Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Levi, and today I have with me Pastor, retired Pastor Karen Casperson. And um, today we're just going to talk a little bit about what it looks like um, coming from somebody myself who has um, who grew up in a in the church setting, Christian church setting, and coming out as a transgender man and what that's looked like as far as rejection from the church and uh, different scriptures and things like that. So um, Karen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. I'm Karen Casperson. I'm an ordained Lutheran pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It's a matter of that's the most liberal of the Lutheran branches. I have a bachelor degree in religious studies and I have a four-year degree from uh, Trinity Lutheran Seminary in Columbus, Ohio. That means I have four years of study and one year included in that of being an associate pastor and I ended up with a Master in Divinity. I am theoretically retired because pastors never seem to actually retire and I've become more active in social justice and issues with the LGBTQ community. Thank you and thank you for uh, agreeing to do this video with us today. So a lot of the passages, well, actually all of the passages that I'll be referencing today are from the NIV or the New International Version Bible. And the conversation that we're going to have is predicated on a lot of conjecture mm -hmm. and your own interpretation as a pastor who has spent you know, many years on this, this journey. So as a transgender man, um, actually first let me preface to say that, you know, because of my journey, you know, I don't really know anymore where I fall on the spiritual spectrum, but um, I understand, and the reason for this video is that, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, come from, you know, being brought up in the church and from, you know, the Christian community who have come out in the LGBTQ plus community, and have been rejected and they are still kind of lost and trying to figure out where they fit in so while this doesn't really so much apply to me anymore i know that there are a lot of people that could really hear or um, use what you know you have to say mm -hmm. so as a transgender man i do have a lot of questions about your view on where where i or where someone like me would come into play in the bible but a lot of my questions are centered around scripture that also condemns homosexuality as well. And the reason being is because many, we use air quotes, Christians are never going to view me as a man. For me, well, or any trans person other than, you know, the sex that they were assigned at birth. So for me, all they're ever going to see is someone who is confused, uh, just a confused person who was born female and is still female in their eyes, regardless of how I look or what bathroom I use. So the verses about homosexuality do come into play because while as a man, I'm in a straight relationship with a woman, but to people who don't view me as a, a male, I'm very much in a same-sex relationship to those people. So this one is a little bit long, but this one talks about... Um, it's Genesis chapter 19, which tells us of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, a story most people are at least somewhat familiar with. So I'm going to go ahead and read the chapter here. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down his, with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who, you ne who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. 
but the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people was so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, Hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought that he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hands in the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. A little bit long, but even rereading that here and now, to me the part that stands out, or my takeaway from that, is that the city was destroyed because of the wicked acts of homosexuality. And this entire chapter is often used against the LGBTQ plus community as not only condemnation, but also a warning of sorts saying, God destroys people who partake in homosexuality. So what is what is your take on what is your takeaway from that chapter or your interpretation of that passage? There are several points to be made here. First of all, you need to realize that Lot is a foreigner. He's not a native of, of, so of Sodom. He's a matter of he's a stranger in the city, and what he does is he has two people come. They're also strangers. And it's very important in the Jewish culture to have hospitality. So what Lot does is says to the two men, come on, stay at my house and have a good meal and sleep well. They protest, but again, according to his understanding of hospitality, he then invites them in, insists that he come. The men in the town are very upset about this, not only to have a foreigner in their midst, but he's showing hospitality to more foreigners. So what they want to do is have the strangers come out and have sex with them. The issue is not sex. The issue really is rape. Because you have to realize, to humiliate a man, the easiest way to do it is to have sex with them, force them to have sex. And it's a matter of lowers them below um, being a human being. They're being taken advantage of, and Lot would say, no, don't do that. It's a matter of, they're my guests, leave them alone. And the men in the city are then upset about that. So then Lot, and this is a part that I can never quite understand why people don't say anything about this, Lot offers his two daughters to go out and be raped. And that is not a point there. It's a matter of the men want to humiliate, but Lot is willing to give his daughters, who are less than human beings as well, they are basically property in scripture, but he doesn't care about what happens to his daughters. He wants to protect his strangers. That's an important point, I think, there. The other thing is, to go on with that, Sodom and Gomorrah is not uh, destroyed because of homosexuality. That was really a way of, for them saying, not showing hospitality. They wanted to inflict pain upon those who were not part of their own culture, their own town. Further, in Ezekiel, it says something along the lines of, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of social injustice. Violating hospitality laws would qualify as that. And that was the issue 
of treating people unfairly and justly is more the issue than the sexual part of that. The sexual part is just a way to demean the foreigners. You also have to go on to the verses where you stopped. There, um, Lot and his two daughters are out in hiding. And the daughters suddenly realize the important thing for women to do is to have children. And there are no men around there for him. So they get their father drunk and they seduce their father, one one night and one the other. And they had a son by him, each one of them. And that is not mentioned either in this passage. That's incest. And that is not commented, just like the uh, proposed rape of the daughters. It's commented on the homosexuality issue, which is not the issue at all. It's a matter of being degraded, which is what rape is. Thank you. Thank you for you know, your interpretation of that. So going on, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 tells us that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. A lot of folks use this passage to justify exclusion of transgender people, especially those who don't fit in the gender binary. So what are your thoughts on that particular passage and the way it's been used to justify the gender binary? You have to realize a couple things about scripture. First of all, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, are what I call myths. And I get in trouble for saying that, so I often say symbolic stories. Creation stories and how people began and even the flood are common stories that people could understand in all different cultures. They have Mesopotamian stories like that. The difference in the ones in scripture are that God is the center and God is the one who shows love and grace. In the other outside culture ones, they have polytheists and they're very whimsical and sometimes very vindictive, the other polytheistic gods. So this is a matter of that. Second thing you need to realize is scripture was written by men for men. And even the language there, God God made us in God made man in his image. That's the patriarchy, the male dominance of all through scripture. All the books of the Bible were written by men. So therefore, considering the culture at that time, the women were less than anything. So men were considered higher. And that's just a symbolic thing. The other thing you have to realize is that scripture was not given to people to write down with you know, a magic finger and God wrote the whole thing. What I believe as a Lutheran is it's an inspired word of God that is subject, you have to realize, the Bible was originally uh, oral tradition. Eventually it was written down and people do make mistakes when writing. And when it was copied, we don't have any of the original scriptures to begin with. So we have pieces we put together. It's been copied. Now, I bet if you looked at my handwriting, you might just not be able to read all of it and put in your own interpretation or assuming what I would say. So that's part of it. Then you've got to realize it's copied and translated in different languages. Scripture, it may come shocking, is not written in King James English. It's a matter of coming from Greek and Hebrew, so it's had that possibility of mistranslation. So you consider then the time it was written and the fact that it was written basically symbolically Superior bearings are, at that time, considered to be male. Therefore, God must be male. But let's fast forward to the New Testament, Galatians 3.28. This is written by Paul after the time of Jesus. Jesus tore down barriers between people, and Paul commented on it. In Christ there is no east nor west, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. So I think that counters that verse, which is um, part of... A symbolic part of scripture and the words in Galatians are quoting Jesus and I Paul's interpretation of Jesus and I think that's more important than that one verse taken out of context thank you one particular passage that was thrown directly at me was Deuteronomy 22 5 that states a woman must not wear men's clothing nor a man wear women's clothing for the for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this 
So what is your interpretation of this passage, and what do you think about the way that it's used to condemn those who are transgender uh, or non-binary, or even those who enjoy drag and cross-dressing? And I'm also really curious how the Bible could possibly determine or differentiate what's considered male or female clothing, you know, given how much that's changed over the years. First of all, you have to realize that both men and women at that time wore tunics. Men did not wear pants. So it was a matter how can they make a statement like that? What does it mean to be in men's clothing or women's clothing? It certainly changed. You and I are both sitting here in pants. So that means neither one of us is dressed according to that. How many children love dressing up in costumes or playing dress up as little girls? What does that mean? Um, there's a, a pastor out there now who's very right wing who is saying that women should throw away all their pants because it's not in the scripture. And that husbands should take their pants, the women's pants, and throw them out or burn them. And if their wife protests, she, that's an argument worth having and he should win. What does it mean? What is tradition at that point? Also in New Testament scripture, it talks about a woman should not wear her hair loose. That's why for generations, women wore hats in church. The point at the context was, at that point, women who wore their hair loose were advertising the fact that they were prostitutes. The women were to wear hats in church in order to show that that was not their profession, that they did not subscribe to uh, prostitution. Today, it's totally irrelevant. I certainly do not have that kind of activity in my life. But again, what does it mean to be dressed up? It changes from generation to generation. It's cultural. Thank you. So up until now, I've asked a lot of questions that correlate to scripture, you know, coming from the Old Testament. And I hear many people take that the Old Testament, you know, is obsolete uh, since the coming of Christ, you know, who died to take our sins. It renders the Old Testament obsolete, you know, for that per for that reason. But my question is, how could a God go from being so vengeful in the Old Testament to more understanding and forgiving in the New Testament? As an all-knowing power, I don't believe that God could have changed or grown in any capacity, so why are they portrayed so differently between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Again, I think it's cherry-picking things. In the Old Testament, God is seen as more of a judge, giving ways that they are to live in harmony with what God wants and with what's being helpful to other people, lifting each other up. So that's really in the kind in the early part, the early five books of the Bible. And then scripture is filled with the Psalms and the uh, prophets, where it does show God as loving and caring. So unfortunately, people just take that one part, again, and focus just on that, as opposed to taking scripture in totality. With the coming of Christ, it shows a little more emphasis on grace. And if you remember that Jesus is fully divine and fully human. So Jesus is showing the loving and understanding and merciful way that God treats people and that we can see it firsthand. The Old Testament, again, I think builds, uh, the New Testament builds on the Old Testament. Our view of God hasn't, uh, God hasn't changed. Our view of God has changed. It's a matter of Jesus showing us a more impactful way that we are to respond to God's love and share God's love with others. Thank you, and I like that interpretation of it. So while the Old Testament spoke a lot more to homosexuality and the like, it is still referenced some in the New Testament. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, 9, verses chapter 6 verses 9 through 10 states, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then again in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 through 10 states, We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is not or is made not for the righteous, 
But for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, and for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. And then again, in Romans chapter 1, we read about God's wrath against sinful humanity. And tucked in there in verses 26 through 27, we see homosexuality once again referenced as sinful in nature. The scripture states, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So, these three blocks of scripture are further, quote-unquote, proof for many that homosexuality is wrong and goes against God's will because it is explicitly called by name in the New Testament. So I'm curious of your takeaway and interpretation of those verses. First of all, you skipped over the Gospels. Jesus is absolutely nothing about homosexuality. Jesus was loving and inclusive of all. And again, you have to remember, sex at that time was more about procreation than recreation. So if you're talking about sex between two men or two women, it can't you can't produce a child. So it's a matter of uh, going against that, what it's to be. I want to go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. The word sodomy comes from Sodom. And what it means is anal sex or oral sex, which also can occur among, between two men and a woman in a marital or extramarital relationship. Here also in these three scriptures you talked about, it also talks about fornicators, which is consensual sex between an unmarried man and an unmarried woman. So there a whole different set of understanding if you understand the meanings of the words, the definitions, and it puts a whole different uh, aspect on it. Again, it goes into why pick out those particular issues when there are so many others there. I bet there's some people who condemn homosexuality who are greedy and do all things in those uh, others that listed. Also, in 1 Corinthians, you cited that verse, people in, who are knowing Christians, forget that seven verses later is 1 Corinthians 13, which is often known as the love chapter, which talks about how we are to love one another. And the greatest of these are all are hope, faith, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So doesn't that kind of counteract the condemnations in earlier verses? Also, what you're reading is maybe a couple pages. Um, I have to tell you, my Bible has about a thousand pages. So to have a few verses picked out of context, probably mistranslated, and use those to condemn anyone is just ludicrous. The rest of the Bible, to me, speaks very clearly about how God wants us to be, as shown through Jesus. Loving, accepting, showing great grace, being merciful to one another. And the verses that are picked out of context are about condemnation. And I don't think that's God's point of view at all. Thank you. So while my own situation obviously is unique to me, the underlying theme of my situation, which is rejection due to religious beliefs, is not at all uncommon. The same verses that are used or were used against me by my own mother, no less, are the same verses used to judge, condemn, and alienate and ostracize people within the LGBTQ community by so-called Christians. You know, my own mother sent me every Bible verse imaginable that was used to condemn homosexuality or that she felt was condemning of being transgender. She even took it upon herself to, with anointment oil, uh, to put a cross on all four of my bedroom walls. And then, that was right after I came out, and then she also took it on the outside of my bedroom door and wrote Jesus vertically on the outside of my bedroom door. And I didn't find out till a little bit later when I actually went to move out, but she had also placed a Bible under my mattress. And all of that kind of felt a little bit like she was trying to exercise some sort of demon out of me. So I'm going to ask you to try to get in her head a little bit, if that's possible, and tell me why you think she might have done that, or where you think that reaction was coming from. 
I have to laugh at that, I'm sorry. Anointing oil is used to, as a sign of Jesus. It's used for healing, and that's why I guess she wanted you to be healed. And Jesus on the door, so maybe every time you entered your uh, bedroom, you could see and remind of Jesus. The Bible under the mattress, I'm sorry, you're going to get it by osmosis. It just ridiculous. Where she's coming from, I think, is especially these days, it's important to have the upset by change and want things the same or the way they've always been. If you want to go back out through history, that's what's been used against Jews, um, to go against them. I have, a, I guess, basically a minor in Jewish history, and that shows very clearly how Scripture has been used to demonize the Jews as well. So it's a matter of Scripture can be used as a weapon for almost any situation. I'm a woman pastor, and I have heard my share of condemnation about what I do. But it's also a matter of, I think people need to know their right, have something to hold on to. Our world is getting so changing by the minute. Look at social media or the news, and things happen in real time. And it's scary. The world has changed. We're no longer a manufacturing society. We don't do coal mining very much. So people want to hold on to that because it's safe and secure that they want that again. Their lives are changing. It's not the way it was in the 50s when I grew up. And there is a desire for simplicity and no change. And unfortunately, those, I think, in the LGBTQ um, plus um, community, it's a matter of they're the victims of that because people were not that well known before. It was, sorry, in the closet, and therefore people didn't have to face it. And now it's different that Jews and people of color, same, same thing, it's just sexuality is more of a charged issue for folks. It touches closer to home and therefore is against their expectation of what is normal. And that's, I believe, what your mother was upset about. She wanted you back, the one with the um, female assigned at birth. You were no longer her child in her eyes. Thank you. I know that that, you know, that's all, you know, your interpretation, but I appreciate that view. So what do you think about, as a pastor, what do you think about those, um, the actions that she took in relation to me being transgender? I don't really think they were Christian at all. I fall more on the uh, idea of voodoo, as far as I'm concerned. That's not the way it's about. We are to love one another, and to try to impose our understandings on someone else, I think, is unchristian. And I'm not using air quotes on that one. Thank you. For me personally, I dealt with a lot of hurt at the hands of my mother and her her beliefs. Most of that came at me after I came out as being transgender, of course. Um, you know, my belief in a higher power or God, I'm not sure what exactly I would refer to it as, has never really wavered. I believe in something. Um, but, you know, because of my experiences that, um, experiences with the Christian church or that I've experienced with my own mother specifically, I, I really just can't bring myself to call myself a Christian anymore. And I mean, not even taking into consideration how much, you know, my views have changed over since the time I come out. But, you know, my moral, if my, if my take, if my beliefs had stayed the same, if I still had the same beliefs that I had back then, I feel that my moral fabric is so fundamentally different than that of my mother that we couldn't both possibly be Christians. So one of us would be a Christian and the other would not because you can't have two people on so fundamentally different, you know, in morals be the same, you know, religion, or be true to the same religion. That's just not possible. But I've come to realize that my mother's not an outlier because it seems like the Christian church has really shifted more into Christian nationalism, where the role has where the role of the church has shifted from a source of spiritual healing to a political entity more 
more concerned with forcing the rest of the country to fall in line with their own beliefs. And, you know, that just takes away one of the fundamental aspects upon which our country was founded upon, which was the freedom of religion. And we know that we can't have freedom of religion unless we also have freedom from religion. You know, I remember how lost I felt in the beginning of my transition because I didn't feel like I had a home in the church anymore. And, you know, nobody in the church even had to say anything to me. I just felt immediately judged when I walked into a church because as a whole, I know how Christianity views the LGBTQ plus community. And while I'm not quite in that same feeling of lost anymore, like I was at the beginning because my views have shifted so much, I do understand and know that many people still are. So what words would you have for someone like me at that time, not me now, but like I, for me at that time, who has experienced such tremendous hurt by the church or members of the church. I'm with you. I don't consider myself a Christian the way many people do these days. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I hold to my faith. And I grieve at the number of people who are confusing nationalism and Christianity and assuming that that is the right way to be, imposing their beliefs and their views on anybody else. God created us in so many ways. Each one of us has a different belief. I'm a Lutheran, but I can pretty much tell you my uh, beliefs are not exactly in lockstep with everybody else. We all have our own life experiences that color how we feel. I Again, I am so sorry that you've had that experience because that's not Christianity. And I bet in some respects the silence hurt more than the words to know that you were being shunned. And that's just not how it's to be. We are to be loving towards one another. Some of the best Christians I, I know are atheists. And it's a matter of what you truly believe, not in lockstep with what someone has told you to believe. And I think in some cases these days that there are those who either manipulating people to believe the way they want them to for their own benefit, whether it's money or power or prestige, they encourage people to follow blindly. And that's not how we are to be. We are to be love and understanding. It's easier to keep people in line if you frighten them. And that, I think, is what's happening. People want it to go back the way it was. They want simple. They want easy yeses and noes. They don't like ambiguity. And I think that's part of what's happening. And when people don't know how to act, they act the way they're being told. And I think with sexuality, that's such a subject with religion so dear to people that if the world is changing, they want something that is beyond their understanding. It's not their frame of reference. And I think it lash out about that and how sad that is. We as Christians should be the loving ones, not condemning and judging others, because that's not what God does to us. God loves us just the way we are. We're not condemned. We're loved and accepted and shown grace and mercy. So what would you say to someone either in my position or a similar position if they still wanted to deepen their relationship with God or a higher power, but they couldn't bring themselves to attend church or a formal religious institution? I wish I had a better answer for you on that. Because unfortunately, if anybody, I mean, they, some of them have the very extreme views like you've experienced. Other churches tend to just ignore the issue and might quietly avoid people. When I became divorced, I experienced that. I called it the leprosy, div uh, leprosy of divorce because people then shunned away from me as if my marriage breakup would somehow rub off on them. And that, I think, is partly what happens. There are churches out there. If, in the mainline denominations, I can't quite say the same for the non-denominational churches because they tend to have more conservative views. In the Lutheran Church, for example, there are congregations called RIC, Reconciling in Christ, which openly say that they embrace the LGBTQ plus community. They're few and far between. In congregations now, I believe you'd find some people who are loving and accepting. I'm not so sure that's the majority. So as far as attending church, if you could find one that was truly open and understanding, that would be a blessing. 
I think there's a difference between Christianity and Christians. And there's a difference between spirituality and religious. I believe more in the Christianity, the way it's explained in the Bible. Again, one of love and grace. And that to me is it. But Christians aren't perfect, and they misread things like you have been sharing. And it's so much damage has been done by Christians against other people, and I have to condemn that. And that even continues today almost too much. Well, everything is too much. But it's still, I'm not so sure anybody could find peace in a church like this again, and I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer on that. I remain in the organized church because I feel I'm a lifelong Lutheran. I was baptized at three weeks old. It's who I am, and it's what I believe. I also think sometimes the best way to affect change is to be within the structure instead of coming at it from without. I guess by wearing this collar that I'm wearing, it gives me a little bit more credibility maybe because I have this background as a Christian that I can sit here and condemn what others are saying that I know is outright wrong. But I certainly would hope anybody who feels that way would find a safe person to confide in and to share grace the way we are to one another. Now, if you had a Christian come to you whose child had come out as gay or transgender, and they wanted to meet with you as a pastor because they were struggling to accept their child because of what the Christian church as a whole preaches and what the Bible insinuates in its current format, what would you tell them? This is your child. You know who your child is. And that, I think, loving is the most important thing that we need to accept and try to understand. And if nothing else, try to understand. Ask the questions, I suppose. Why do you feel this way? What is, explain what's going on. And then, even if there's confusion, try to stay with it. And remember, love trumps everything else. And that's what's most important, is this is your child. Don't ever forget that. Same child you've raised just a different understanding now. Thank you. So, I know this wasn't in something, you know, that we had uh, prepared prior to our meeting, but, you know, for me personally, when I came out, you know, I dealt with a lot of blowback from my mother. Um, she was sending me all these uh Bible verses that were condemning who I was and um, basically telling me that I was going to hell for you know something that I felt I couldn't control. That view has not changed because I still feel like, I mean, I have no control over what I feel. You know, I don't feel female in any sense of the term. Um, I feel wholly and completely male. Now, when, let's see, I, that was... 12, 13 years ago. So, I mean, I was like 19 at the time. And, you know, I, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, I grew up in the church. You know, I started going to church with my babysitter when I was three. Um, I was baptized in a brethren church. And then um, at some point I switched over, I think it was about 10 or 11, I switched over to going to a Methodist church with my dad, was confirmed into the Methodist church. And then I've attended various um, non-denominational churches, a couple different ones since. Um, now I stopped as a teenager, especially as I um, come into this new understanding of myself. But even though I had stopped attending church, you know, my beliefs were still very much a big part of me. I still believed in the Bible. I still believed in God. And to uh, to see all of these Bible verses that were condemning me for who I was, for something I could not control, mm -hmm. it was, it was kind of, it was just, it, it felt like it was breaking me. So, you know, I really didn't know what to do. You know, I got to a point one night um, where I grabbed my gun and I took it with me. I drove up onto the mountain and I sat there for a long time. It was 
I don't know, nine o'clock at night and just overlooking the town and trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do. Uh, did I want to kill myself? No. But what I did want was I wanted the pain to stop. And I also was stuck in this terrible place of not knowing really what to do because I felt that it would be better for me to kill myself and die as a female instead and, and go to heaven instead of continuing with a transition and dying and going to hell because I transitioned. And I knew though that I mean, yeah, you, I mean, somebody could come at me and say, well, why don't you just live as a female? That wasn't an option. I mean, I had reached a point in my life where it was completely do or die. I could not, I did not have a future as a female. Um, you know, when kids are growing up, they have all these grand ideas of, you know, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer. But a lot of people, you know, they see themselves in also in other roles, you know, they see themselves um, as a wife or as a mother. And I didn't, I didn't have those feelings. And I couldn't see those. It's like my life after that point where I was at, it, it, go, it went black because I could not see myself living any further as a female. And I never, I didn't feel that way as a child either. It was just one of those day by day things. And you know, that changed after I transitioned where, you know, I could see myself later on as a husband, as a father, that kind of thing. But, you know, obviously I ultimately ended up deciding not to harm myself and I continued on with my transition which I have zero regrets about even though it took me you know far away from family from the faith a lot of different things and I still have zero regrets to that but it's it's a common fact that you know a lot of people in especially youth in the LGBTQ plus community you know struggle with um depression and they're much more likely to commit suicide and that is just it becomes even more of a greater risk when they're experiencing rejection especially from a parent i mean it's hard when you experience rejection from anywhere but when it comes from your parent from people who are supposed to love you unconditionally that's a very very deep cut mm -hmm. and you know um So I certainly understand what puts someone in that position of feeling like they, it, it's just better to end it because I was there. So what would you say to someone, if someone were like me, like I was, you know, at the beginning of my transition, uh, what would you say to them now if they just didn't know what to do or where to turn and they just thought that, you know, suicide might be a better option because of the rejection that they're experiencing from their family due to religious reasons, especially due to religious reasons, because their parents feel like they're on you know this moral high road and that they are doing the right thing. First of all, I'm sorry that you had that feeling, but I can understand with the rejection you were feeling, particularly from your mother, that has got to have been a very deep cut. I'm just very grateful that you made the decision to continue on and follow who you are as a man and I appreciate your courage and bravery in doing this as well. As far as one of the songs from uh, Beauty and the Beast, Gaston, the very masculine person, was trying to rescue the woman he wants to marry from the beast. So he riles up the townspeople and tells them to kill the beast. One of the lines in there is, we always fear what we don't understand. And I think that's part of it. You're, you were stepping outside your mother's comfort zone and how sad it is it came from a family member and the church that's a double blow so it's a matter of I'm glad you followed your path someone else being the situation I hope they find someone who can embrace them the way they need to be physically emotionally whatever happens I'm very worried about our school districts which are some of which are requiring um, counselors to tell a parent children have so few places to go that are safe a teacher or a counselor a pastor should be a safe place where they can share their feelings unfortunately we're losing that um, it makes me so angry 
but I would hope that that person felt comfortable enough with a friend or somebody to lead them to get the support and the unconditional love that they need. Because I'd hate to lose a wonderful human being with gifts and talent and to lose something by such heinous acts and words that that cut. I'm glad you're here, Eli. Levi. Thank you. Um, now I have one other question for you before I forget. Uh, and this is not tied directly to scripture per se, but it is um, something that is most commonly thrown at transgender people more than any uh, more than anyone else in the community. But we hear a lot of times where people look at us and say, "But God doesn't make mistakes," insinuating that God made a mistake when we were born. For for me specifically, that I was born in a female body, but with a male brain. What, are you, what What's your thought on that? God doesn't mistake doesn't make mistakes those who feel that way are making the mistake I think it's each one of us is a glorious child of God made in our own way to be unique we don't have cookie cutter people I am so glad that each of us is so different um, I wouldn't want the world to be filled with Karens and even that stereotype that's kind of funny right now but it's a matter each one of us is unique God doesn't make mistakes people who feel that way and judge others are the ones that are making mistakes. They're putting God in a box, and that's outside their comfort zone. And God won't be put in a box. God's love is all-encompassing. Whether we as humans try to limit it or not, God doesn't. Thank you. And thank you for your time today. You know, I appreciate you being willing to sit down and have this conversation and so that, you know, we can, you know, let others out there know that this is not, not all Christians view and it's um, not, if you, you know, if you believe in God, that that's not necessarily their view of it either. Um, yeah, just, just thank you. I appreciate that a lot. I want to thank you for this opportunity, and I want to say how sorry I am at the church and people, Christians who say they believe in condemning. I'm sorry that's happened to you and to anyone else. It shouldn't be. I see God as a loving God, and churches should be embracing. Christians should be embracing one, everyone else. And I'm sorry that that's not been your experience. And thank you for this opportunity. It's been great. Thank you.